Before we can move on with the discussion regarding the Haber-Bosch process, we will need to define Le Chatelier's principle. It is defined as, when a system at equilibrium is subjected to a disturbance, the composition of the system adjusts, so as to tend to minimize the effect of the disturbance. This is a qualitative rule of thumb, where a disturbance causes the reaction to shift in order to return to the equilibrium constant K. The only way that K itself is modified is through changes in temperature, since temperature is the only variable in the definition of K. Now let's apply Le Chatelier's principle to various conditions. First, the effect of a catalyst. Recall that equilibrium occurs when the forward and reverse reaction rates are equal. A catalyst increases both reaction rates by changing the pathway the reaction follows, as illustrated in the figure on the bottom right. This figure shows two reaction pathways, where the parabolic pathway isn't catalyzed and the multi-step pathway is catalyzed. However, this does not affect the equilibrium concentrations of the reaction since the change in reaction rate is equivalent to both directions. If we look at this in the context of the Gibbs free energy, recall that the standard Gibbs free energy of the reaction plus RT times ln K is equal to zero, and since the standard Gibbs free energy of the reaction is a state function, the pathway that the reaction takes is irrelevant to K. The change in Gibbs free energy is the same for both pathways. Therefore, adding a catalyst does not affect the equilibrium concentrations. What about changes in temperature? Returning to the Haber-Bosch process, which converts nitrogen and hydrogen gas to ammonia, we calculated that the heat of the reaction is negative 91.6 kilojoules per mole. How would an increase in temperature change the composition of the equilibrium? Well, Le Chatelier's principle tells us that by increasing the temperature, and as a consequence heat, the equilibrium will shift left to consume the added heat and favor more reactants. This can be visualized by thinking that heat is a product in this reaction, and the increase in temperature adds heat to the system, which must be consumed, therefore shifting the equilibrium towards the reactants. We've said that changing the temperature is the only way to change K for a given reaction. So, let's quantify how K changes with varying temperature. Recall the gibb helmholtz equation, which is the partial differential with respect to temperature at constant pressure of the standard change in Gibbs free energy of the reaction divided by the temperature is equal to the negative of the standard change in enthalpy of the reaction divided by the temperature squared. If we substitute in the equilibrium expression, then we get the partial differential with respect to temperature at constant pressure of negative RT ln K divided by T is still equal to the negative of the change in standard enthalpy of the reaction divided by T squared. On the left-hand side, the t's cancel out, and we can take out a negative r and move it to the right-hand side in order to get the partial differential with respect to temperature at constant pressure of the natural logarithm of the equilibrium constant is equal to the change in standard enthalpy of the reaction divided by r t squared. This equation has also been called the Van Toff equation. If we can assume that the standard enthalpy of the reaction does not change significantly over the change in temperature, then we can integrate both sides, meaning that we have an integral from one equilibrium constant K1 to the second equilibrium constant K2 of d ln K is equal to the integral from T1 to T2 of the standard change in the enthalpy of the reaction divided by RT squared times dt. The result of this integral is that we get ln K being evaluated between K1 and K2, and that's equal to the change in the standard enthalpy of the reaction divided by R times negative 1 over T, which is evaluated between T1 and T2. And then applying the fundamental theorem of calculus leads to the natural logarithm of K2 minus the natural logarithm of K1 being equal to the change in standard enthalpy of the reaction divided by R times 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2. This equation is how we can quantify changes to the equilibrium constant K with changes in temperature. Let's return to the Haber-Bosch process, which is this reaction where we convert nitrogen and hydrogen into ammonia, which is used to make fertilizer. And what we saw before was that at room temperature and pressure, we saw that by putting the reactants into a chamber, the equilibrium is in such a way that the reaction moves almost all the way to completion and that we form ammonia, which is great. However, the reaction is very slow, and so what equilibrium concepts tells us is where things go, but it doesn't tell us how long the process takes. And so in order to speed up the reaction, what we do is that we add a catalyst, 
and we increase the temperature. And so what we need to do now is figure out, let's predict what happens with this change in temperature and how this affects our equilibrium. So the first thing that we're going to do is we have to recalculate what our K is because we've just discussed that when we increase the temperature, we're going to then be changing our equilibrium constant K. That's essentially what this first question is asking us is we're going to calculate the equilibrium constant K when we've increased the temperature now to 463 Kelvin. So recall when we did this problem previously and we calculated K, we saw that at 298 Kelvin, we had an equilibrium constant that was equal to 5.84 times 10 to the 5. And so based on this result that we had from before, we're going to now calculate what is the equilibrium constant at 463 Kelvin, this elevated temperature, so that we can increase the reaction rate. So using the expression that we just figured out before we just calculated previously, the natural logarithm of K2 minus the natural logarithm of K1, and that's equal to the standard enthalpy of the reaction divided by the gas constant R, and that's multiplied by 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2. I'm just going to move my natural logarithm of K1 to the other side to isolate for the natural logarithm of K2. So I have natural logarithm of K2 is equal to the change in the standard enthalpy of the reaction divided by R times 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2, and to that I'm going to add plus the natural logarithm of K1. At this point, I'll start substituting in numbers, the natural logarithm of K2, and that's equal to negative 91.6 times 10 to the 3 joules. And that's I get from my standard heat of the reaction, which was just provided up here. My gas constant is in joules, 8.3145. My T1, well, that's going to be the values that I have already. So this is at 298 and this 5.84 times 10 to the 5, so I have 1 over T1, 1 over 298. From that I'm going to subtract off T2, which is at this elevated temperature, the 463, so 1 over 463. And to that I'm going to add the natural logarithm of 5.84 times 10 to the 5. When I evaluate both these expressions, I still get the natural logarithm of K2. That's equal to minus 13.175 plus 13.278. When I add these two numbers together, I get the natural logarithm of K2 being equal to 0 0.1027. The inverse of a natural logarithm is an exponent, so I take e to the power of to both sides, which means I get K2 is equal to e to the power of 0 0.1027. When I evaluate that, I get 1.11. And so the really important thing that we should see here is that this value for K is much smaller than it was before. And so we know just in, intuitively that as we decrease the, rate, or the equilibrium constant K, what we're going to do is that the concentrations at equilibrium are now going to be more balanced between reactants and products than they were before. Since before we had this really huge K that was times 10 to the 5, and now we've dropped five orders of magnitude and we're now at times 10 to the 0. So let's now see what our new equilibrium concentrations are based on what we just calculated. So in this problem, we're still going to start with the same one bar of nitrogen and three bars of hydrogen gas, and we're going to determine the equilibrium concentrations of the reactions and products at this new elevated temperature. And so to do so then, we start with, again, our equilibrium constant is equal to the activity of the ammonia squared divided by the activity of the nitrogen times the activity of the hydrogen cubed. And we do these things basically to these powers because these powers again come from the balanced chemical reaction, which we would write as N2 plus 3H2 is in equilibrium with 2NH2, or NH3 I should say. And so if we build our ice table again, where we would say we start with 1, 3, and 0 for the ammonia, we're going to lose 1x of the nitrogen, we're going to lose 3x of the hydrogen, and then we're going to add 2x of the ammonia. And so what that means then at equilibrium we're going to have 1 minus x, we're going to have 3 minus 3x, and we're going to have 2x. And so these are the values and then we're going to substitute in for our activities because we assume that these gases behave ideally. So we have our equilibrium constant, which we've just calculated, 1.11, and that's going to be equal to 2x squared divided by 1 minus x 
times 3 minus 3x cubed. This equilibrium coefficient or constant is still quite large, and so we probably can't do any approximations. We'll just solve this analytically. And so what that means is that I can distribute out certain quantities. I have the 1.11 on the left. I have a 2 squared on top, so that gives me 4x squared. On the bottom, I have 1 minus x. And inside the second part of the denominator, I have a 3, which I can factor out. And that 3, then I also take to the power of 3 when I factor it outside, which 3 times 3 times 3 is 27. And that leaves me with 1 minus x raised to the power of 3. If I then move these terms to the other side, what I get is 7.48, and that gives me an x squared divided by 1 minus x raised to the power of 4. And so what I can do now is I can take the square root of both sides, the square root of 7.48, the square root of x squared over 1 minus x raised to the power of 4. And what that gives me is 2.735, being equal to x divided by 1 minus x squared. And so then in this case now we can actually write this in terms of a quadratic. And so if I move this denominator, this 1 minus x squared, over to the left hand side, I multiply both sides by it, I get 2.735, and that's going to be equal to 1 minus x squared being equal to x. I'll now apply FOIL first, outside, inside, last, to the 1 minus x squared term. So 2.735, 1 minus 2x plus x squared. That's still equal to x. I'm going to distribute in the 2.735. So I'm going to get 2.735x squared minus 5.47 times x. To that I'm going to add 2.735 and I'm going to move my x to the other side so I'm going to have a minus x and that's equal to 0 and what this finally gives me in terms of a quadratic is 2.735 x squared minus 6.47 x plus 2.735 being equal to 0. I'm going to take these terms and put it into the quadratic equation. x is equal to 6.47 plus or minus, minus 6.47 all squared, minus 4 times 2.735 times 2.735. All of that is inside a square root. Then I'm going to divide by 2 times 2.735. Now if I simplify, what I get is x being equal to 6.47 plus or minus 3.46 divided by 5.47. And so if I apply this, where if I do the plus and the minus cases, what I get is an x being equal to 0 0.55 or 1.82. And if we look back at our ice table, what we can see is that we have 1 minus x squared, 3 minus 3x, and that basically helps us choose which one of these two answers we can take. Because if I were to take an x of 1.82, then this number would be a negative number, and this number would also be a negative number, which is something that is impossible. So we would immediately then cross off the 1.82, and we would select the 0.55 as our answer. And so if we were to then calculate what the final pressures are at equilibrium, we have a pressure of the nitrogen being equal to 1 minus 0 0.55, and that gives us an answer of 0 0.45 bar. We have our pressure of hydrogen, and that's equal to 3 minus 3 times 0 0.55, and that gives us an equilibrium pressure of 1.35 bar. And we have our pressure of ammonia and that's equal to 2 times 0 0.55, and that's equal to 1.1. And so then if we calculate the mole fraction of ammonia, like we did last time, we found that this has actually now dropped to 0 0.38. And this isn't great, at least not for our reaction, because remember we're trying to produce ammonia so that we can make fertilizer, and if we do this at an industrial scale, we want it to be a very efficient process. But the reason why we had to do this was that we wanted to increase the temperature so that we can increase the reaction rate. But this has the negative consequence of lowering our output of our reaction. We're going to be forming less products.